Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're tackling sepsis. This is a topic every single nurse must understand inside and out. So let's jump in with our practice question and get things started. A nurse is assessing a client with a suspected bloodstream infection. The client's temperature is 39.2 Celsius. That's 102.5 Fahrenheit. Heart rate is 112, respirs at 24, and a BP of 90 over 55. Which lab value would most support a diagnosis of sepsis? So hold on to that thought and let's dive into our topic discussion. We're going to, of course, start with the basics, okay? What is sepsis? It is essentially the body's extreme overreaction to an infection. Instead of just fighting off the infection in a nice controlled way, the immune system goes and freaks out. It triggers a massive system-wide response that does a lot more harm than good. The infection itself honestly isn't the biggest problem, more so it's how the body responds to it that can end up leading to organ failure and shock. So imagine you've got like a small little kitchen fire on the stove. Normally you'd just grab a fire extinguisher, put it out, you know, not that big of a deal, a little scary, but your house is okay. In sepsis, the body panics and sets off every sprinkler in the house. So now, instead of just dealing with a little kitchen fire, your whole house is flooded and everything inside is getting damaged. That's what happens in sepsis. The body's overreaction causes massive destruction. So how does this process actually happen? We're going to break down four steps. Step one, you already know, we get an infection and it enters the bloodstream. Usually, sepsis starts out with a localized infection. It might be a UTI, pneumonia, maybe just a small little wound infection. But if the bacteria escape that local site and get into the bloodstream, the body goes into emergency mode, setting off every sprinkler in the house, right? The immune system releases a flood of inflammatory chemicals, we call these cytokines, and they go to fight the infection, which you may say sounds like a good thing, but instead of those cytokines having a controlled attack, it turns into a storm. They trigger a dangerous chain of reactions, leading us to step two. We get an increase in capillary membrane permeability. Okay, what does that mean? The capillary membrane, that's the side of those capillaries, those tiny blood vessels. How permeable they are is how easy it is for fluid to go back and forth across that membrane. So one of the first things that these cytokines, these inflammatory chemicals do, is they make that membrane more permeable. Easier way to say it, they get leaky. Imagine your blood vessel is just like a hose. It's carrying water, you know, to your sprinkler, your garden, whatever. Normally, you know, it's closed off. It sends the water where it needs to go. But when our capillary membrane becomes more permeable, it's like we poke a thousand tiny holes in that garden hose and fluid just leaks out into the surrounding tissue instead of staying where it needs to be. So with all this fluid leaking out, less volume, less pressure, our blood pressure goes down. The heart's going to have less fluid to pump. Fluid leaks out of those vessels, low blood volume, hypotension. So now we have step one, an infection in the bloodstream, and step two, those cytokines causing increased capillary membrane permeability. In step three, the next thing these cytokines cause is massive amounts of vasodilation. So vaso are vessels, dilation getting bigger. You know, losing fluid, if that wasn't enough, we also have this huge opening of our blood vessels. And when they get too wide, too dilated, the blood pressure is going to drop even further. So I think you probably know what's coming in step four, massive hypotension that can ultimately lead to shock. We got a combo of leaky vessels causing low blood volume 
and massive vasodilation, both of these leading to profound hypotension, which ultimately means that we just don't have enough pressure for perfusion. We cannot bring blood and therefore oxygen out to our tissues. If blood pressure is too low to deliver oxygen, then we can't use aerobic metabolism. Remember, that uses oxygen to produce energy. Instead, we'll have to switch to anaerobic metabolism, which is way less efficient and has that dangerous downside of lactate, an acid which can cause metabolic acidosis. And that's why lactate is a key marker for sepsis and ultimately septic shock. Lactate goes up, we know our cells are not getting enough oxygen, they are in trouble. As the process continues, organs start to shut down and we can go into multi-organ failure and septic shock. So let's recap that process because the physiology of sepsis can be confusing. Step one, we had that infection, it went into the bloodstream. The cytokines were activated. They went to go fight off this infection and started a cytokine storm where we really overreacted, causing step two, leaky blood vessels, and step three, vasodilation, which in combination lead to step four, profound hypotension, ultimately leading to the inability to perfuse our cells with oxygen. They switch to anaerobic metabolism, our lactate builds up, and we're in shock. So this is why early recognition and treatment of sepsis is so darn critical. We don't get that blood pressure back up, stop the inflammation, and get oxygen to our tissues, we can die. Sepsis absolutely can become fatal. So let's walk through a real client scenario here. I was in the medical ICU, the MICU, during our uh, COVID times, and we had a 67-year-old male. He came in admitted from the emergency department. His wife had brought him in uh, because of confusion and disorientation. She said he might have a little fever. He's a little hot to the touch, but she didn't have a thermometer. Um, but he also wasn't really hungry. He didn't want to eat dinner. Usually he ate anything that she cooked. And she just thought this was strange. This was not his normal behavior. He insisted he was fine. He's like, I'm just not hungry. Leave me alone. Whatever. So I get all this report from the emergency department. I I'm not sure what I'm walking into, but I go into this room and he does not look good. My little across the room assessment, I'm like, oh, he's leaning forward, breathing really quickly. I can see that he's flushed. But when I picked up his hand to take his pulse, his hand was cool to the touch. So the vitals I got on report from the ED, temp 39.5, um, that is 103.1 Fahrenheit, the heart rate of 120, BP of 80 over 50, and respers at 26. So I get, I get these vital sign reports and, and sepsis alarm bells are going off in my head right away. We're febrile, we're tachycardic, we're starting to become hypotensive, so this is an emergency. And sure enough, his wife was definitely right about his mental status. Lethargic, he's not really making sense when he's answering my question. His speech is, is kind of slurred. And all of this change in his mental status tells me that his brain's not getting enough oxygen. Altered mental status is an early sign of sepsis-related organ dysfunction. Our brain should be getting enough oxygen for, for good cognition so he can answer my questions. And that's not going on here. So next, the labs that we decide to draw immediately that I kind of wish had been done in the emergency department, we get an ABG with a lactate, we get a CBC and a CMP. So first, the ABG, it shows us some metabolic acidosis with a pH of 7.29 and a lactate of 6.2. Okay, did anyone else just get really nervous? When I see a high lactate causing metabolic acidosis, I know we've got some sort of shocky something going on. I don't have enough oxygen going out to my cells. Therefore, they have switched into anaerobic metabolism. They're making lactate. That's causing my pH to go down. Obviously, we have a problem. Okay, on the CBC, his H&H &H look fine, he's not bleeding, but his white blood cell count is elevated at 18,000. So honestly, I'm surprised it wasn't higher than that. 
I know we're dealing with some sort of infection. At this point, I don't really know where it came from, but his white blood cell count being up tells me it is somewhere. So we're going to go ahead and follow up with blood cultures so that we can find out what is growing in there. And we know those take a couple days to grow, so I don't have those results right away. I know that they are pending. Last thing I want to mention from the CMP, my metabolic profile, is when I looked at his kidney numbers, that BUN was 31 with a creatinine of 2.3. All right, what organ are we worried about? The kidneys, right? Obviously, they are not getting good blood flow. So that BUN and creatinine are up, telling me again, poor perfusion. So this is a very cut and dry picture of septic shock. He got some sort of infection. It went to the bloodstream. We had a massive cytokine storm causing that increased capillary membrane permeability, that vasodilation, all to say that he got really hypotensive and the rest of his organs were not getting any oxygen. Okay, so what do we do? Treatment for sepsis has to happen fast. Most places are going to have a sepsis bundle and we are going to try to really get things going quick. The first thing you need to do are get those blood cultures, okay? We got to get those cultures before we can start antibiotics so that we can actually identify, hey, what pathogen is growing in our bloodstream, you know, causing a massive problem. That way, later, we can pick the right antibiotic. To start with, we're going to get those blood cultures, and then we're going to start a broad-spectrum antibiotic. In this case, we used vancomycin. That covers a lot of different things, and when our blood culture comes back, then we can narrow that coverage down, if appropriate. Okay, so is that going to fix the problem? Well, ultimately, yeah. I mean, antibiotics are up most importance so that we get that infection good and gone, but... This guy is so hypotensive that his kidneys are shutting down and his brain's not working very good. So we have also got to get his blood pressure up while we're trying to cure that infection with antibiotics. So two things. First, fluids. We immediately started 30 milliliters per kilogram of IV normal saline. That is an isotonic fluid. It goes in the vessel and stays in the vessel to restore intravascular volume and get that blood pressure up. Okay, but remember, we've got leaky blood vessels. So I'm putting this fluid into the garden hose and all those holes, it's just going right out. So I gave fluid, I gave fluid, and his blood pressure was not coming up enough. That meant we had to start a vasopressor. Vasopressor, in this case, we used norepinephrine. It can also be epinephrine, uh, vaso, we have dopamine. These are things that combat those vasodilation and make the vessels smaller. They press on the vessels, vasopressors. So they constrict, they get smaller so we can push that pressure. So between filling up those vessels with fluid and pressing on them to make them smaller, we did get that blood pressure up to a point where we could have good perfusion. And from there, we got to keep an eye on those labs. I want to see that lactate trend down, that pH come up. I know the white blood cell count is going to be elevated for a little while, and it's going to take some time for those kidneys to recover. So the number one thing I want to trend as the nurse is the lactate. I want to make sure I have done my job of giving these cells enough oxygen so that they are not in anaerobic metabolism anymore and they are not making any lactate. If they start making lactate, that going up, we need to do something different. So in this case, it took about six hours until his vitals really started improving. But his assessment improved far before that. Within about an hour of adequate fluid resuscitation, he was pink and warm instead of cool and clammy. His pulses were plus two. His cap refill was no longer delayed. It did take a little longer than six hours for his mental status to come back to baseline. And he ended up being in the ICU for about two days. That was enough time for us to wean him off his vasopressors. Um, he began making urine again. His 
kidneys were recovering. He transferred from the ICU down to the med surge floor, spent a total of eight days with us, and ultimately went home. So as you can see, sepsis can be quite brutal and it's imperative that we catch it early so that we can get those cultures, start those antibiotics, treat the hypotension with fluids and pressors, and provide those cells with oxygen. All right, so let's wrap up with that question we posed at the beginning of our episode. A nurse is assessing a client with a suspected bloodstream infection. The client's temperature is 39.2 Celsius, which is 102.5 Fahrenheit. Heart rate of 112, respers of 24, and a BP of 90 over 55. So which of the following lab values would most support the diagnosis of sepsis? First, we have a hemoglobin of 5.2. Second, a sodium of 155. Third, a lactate of 5. And fourth, a pH of 7.3. Think it through, which of those lab values most support a diagnosis of sepsis? Give your answer out loud with me. It is the third choice there, lactate of five. Remember, a high lactate tells us the cells aren't getting oxygen. They have entered into anaerobic metabolism. And the reason that pH is low at 7.3, by the way, is because that lactate is high at five. It's an acid and it's driving the pH down. So when we see a lactate of five, we know our client, they are not perfusing. This is a hallmark sign of sepsis and septic shock. So the overall key takeaway is to make sure you get that ABG with lactate. You trend that lactate as a critical marker of sepsis progression and to make sure you do everything you can to identify it early. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.